You know, one of the issues is, uh, you know, for us always is how payers deal with this. We talked about share of cost and how you decide, you know, how, what payers think about IV uh, versus oral therapy in terms of invasive uh, delivery and, uh, you know, what the concerns are about the different treatments. You know, paclitaxel is now generic, uh, but it's IV. This drug will be new and not generic and oral. <laughs> so, uh, John, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what your perspective is on this? Yeah. Well, first of all, is it is it two drugs? You described the pill taking, but is it two drugs? So it's two drugs combined. I mean, the product okay. Araxel yeah. includes oral paclitaxel, which is poorly absorbed because of the right. pea glycoprotein. protein. And so it's in one pill. No, actually, <laughs> it's a bunch of pills. There is like okay. a little blister pack with one pill ah, that's okay. in Sequidor, and then another blister pack with a whole bunch of uh, gel tablets that have oral paclitaxel in them. Okay. So for the patient, uh, another consideration, as you uh, alluded to, is going to be the patient cough. Um, okay. IV Paxil, as you know, is generic, and even if patients don't have cost uh, um, uh, coverage with a Medigap policy, uh, they're going to be paying uh, uh, a small amount of dollars. But for an oral therapy, uh, if they have a Medicare Advantage plan or if they have traditional Medicare, they're gonna be paying 25% coinsurance up until they hit their, um, their catastrophic coverage and, and then they got 5% after that. So I think the cost of this, depending on what it is, it may be prohibitive to some patients. And even if patients have uh, Part D coverage, um, they're still gonna have significant costs. Um, I think uh, for, for us as a plan, um, the uh, uh, we, what we observe all the time is simply that if there is only an oral therapy, everybody thinks that the new IV is the the cat's meow because we can ensure compliance. And if there is only an IV therapy, everybody thinks that the new oral therapy is the cat's meow because it will improve patient convenience. And I think there's a mixture of both. I, I think I agree with Claudine that uh, it's nice to have an option. It will be, uh, and I think that fundamentally, though, Medicare is going to require that we cover this drug if it's FDA approved, and we'll have to allow that uh, uh, oral therapy. So I think that the rate limiting factor may be uh, 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 patient preference, in one exception. I don't know how many of your practices or how many of your institutions are involved in OCM, the oncology care model through CMMI. Um, as, as someone noted, I can't remember who now, that uh, most of these patients can, who are on IV therapy can be coached through the toxicities. Um, and uh, if you're in an OCM practice and now these dollars are coming out of your pocket instead of, uh, instead of the federal governments, it may be uh, in the institution's interest in, uh, to try and coach those patients through the IV therapy. There are a lot of private practices that are in OCM, and I'm confident uh, that if they've got a, a generic pack the taxal IV compared to a drug that might cost $10,000 a month, they're going to work very hard to try and get that patient to tolerate the IV pack the taxal. So you see a situation where the payers might, um, and outside of Medicare, might say, uh, you know, we, we would approve IV paclitaxel, but unless there's a demonstrated superiority, we don't want to pay for this expensive drug. What about the difference in neuropathy? What kinds of differences would influence a payer to uh, pay for the more expensive drug? Uh, I, I suspect that if patients developed neurotoxicity on the IV paclitaxel, that, that would be an indication for covering them. I just want to clarify, as I read the abstract, um, it looked like in the modified intention to treat analysis that the overall survival was 20, 27.9 months versus 16.9 months. Do you think that may be um, uh, uh, inaccurate because of the study design? No, I don't think overall survival is one of those hard endpoints, so it's yeah. pretty good, you know, in general. <laughs> Um, yeah. it's the, uh, they have a modified intent to treat population, which are patients who took at least a certain amount of drug, which mm -hmm. is unusual for intent to treat in general, okay. but was based mm -hmm. on the fact of where they did the study and the fact that it was also oral. So, yeah. um, you know, I think that, uh, I, I think that is an impressive difference. And of course, survival differences might, what, that's what you're referring to, might motivate a payer to pay yeah. the more expensive drug. Yeah. Um, and with that, with that said, in practices that are in OCM, where the, the dollars are coming out of their pockets, um, uh, what would they do in that circumstance? I think everyone that I know of in, in five or six practices in OCM would err on the side of giving the drug that produced the longest survival. 
Um, but this, this study is also interesting because it, it highlights the importance of doing phase three trials. If we were just to have done a phase two trial or just looked at progression-free survival as an endpoint, uh, the, the difference was uh, about a month difference between the two and we would have made a, a beta type error and concluded there was no difference when in fact there really was. So uh, I think one of our frustrations as a payer, especially with the CARES Act and especially with, um, or the 21st Century Cures Act, there we go, um, and uh, and the FDA's uh, approval of a lot of drugs based on phase two data alone, and oftentimes single arm phase two trial data, uh, our frustration is that we don't really know at the end of the day whether or not there's a, a meaningful, a patient meaningful uh, endpoint that's been achieved. I think this study showed that <laughs> it was important uh, to look at overall survival because the difference in PFS was very modest. Yeah, I think the neuropathy might also be a way that uh, providers will be able to go back to the uh, to to go back to the um, payer and say, I know you want us to use paclitaxel, but this patient already has underlying neuropathy. Um, so it'll be interesting because I think that may be very motivating data with the overall survival still relatively early uh, yeah. for this trial. Um, Claudine, I know that there's been a question, and Tiffany brought this up a little bit earlier too, that the control arm wasn't our standard control arm for uh, this uh, trial with every three week paclitaxel. How much does that impact your, you know, assessment of overall survival uh, versus mm -hmm. the neuropathy or other endpoints? I mean, I, I, I think it makes us a, a little bit less enthusiastic to jump on that huge overall survival benefit. You know, CLGB uh, quite a while ago did a randomized trial looking at weekly versus Q3 week paclitaxel and showed that, that the weekly was superior. Um, I, don't, I don't remember the differences off the top of my head, but they weren't as marked as the differences in overall survival that were seen in this trial. Um, but I, I think it makes us a little less likely to scream off the rooftops that this is associated with this huge overall survival difference, but it makes you think that it's unlikely to be inferior for sure mm -hmm. uh, and might be a bit superior and there may be a lot of reasons associated with that in terms of in terms of how compliant people were what was going on what was their access to therapy after so i think we need to integrate all of those things when you're thinking about survival benefit and i i do think we need to be a little cautious not to say that this is to remember that this is not compared to what we would think of as the standard paclitaxel mm -hmm. to use in the in this setting mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's an important point. And um, I think what's interesting is that in some settings, weekly paclitaxel and around the world is really not feasible to give. Uh, so it's going to be interesting right. to see, you know, what happens with the further analyses of this data and what people uh, think about it. I, you know, the issue is more expensive, less expensive will also play a role uh, as well in the rest of the world. There are other oral taxanes. Uh, that are being studied, tezotaxel, uh, which is another type of oral taxane, is being given in combination with capecitabine versus capecitabine alone. In the initial trial, which was patients who received taxanes in the adjuvant setting, but not in the metastatic setting, of course. Um, and then in another trial, which is going on now, uh, in patients who are taxane naive. So that will be very interesting. That's an oral agent that's given every three weeks. Um, and then there's another uh, oral taxane called liporaxel, which is an emulsion from Korea uh, that's being tested in a phase two trial compared to weekly paclitaxel in the U.S. now. Um, Priyanka, what are your perspectives on some of these new, newer studies looking at oral taxanes? So the, all of these formulations are different in terms of how they're being delivered, some pills, some emulsions. And we do have experience with liparaxel, which is an emulsion it's given once a week. It's kind of a liquid that a patient drinks uh, twice a day. Um, and it, for the most part, it's relatively well tolerated. Uh, the main issues have been with diarrhea and uh, uh, bad taste in mouth. Uh, but it doesn't require the extensive timing of fasting and number of pills so from that aspect that makes it easier and you only take it once a week so there's not multiple doses over, spread over multiple days. Um, and this drug's approved in Korea for gastric cancer. So I think there is, we will see more of these agents and formulations uh, and probably the one with the best efficacy and um, the, the one that's easiest to deliver in clinic uh, might be the winner. Yeah, and it's 
interesting because tezotaxel is being tested in combination with capecitabine. So that's a little bit different, it's a little bit hard to separate out the toxicities of that uh, combination <laughs> therapy. But that uh, first trial, contested trial, has completed accrual. So uh, we hope to see uh, results in the next year or so, who knows. But uh, it's interesting. I think we're really entering a new era where we're, you know, I think our, um, uh, whatever it is, our sort of threshold for thinking that a new drug is good has increased as we've had a lot of targeted agents. But um, I think having oral therapy for us in the U.S. would be a tremendous advance. We never got the oral venerelbine approved. So, you know, it would be nice that uh, to see some uh, additional options for our patients. Thanks very much for everybody's participation. This was a great discussion.